In the whole discussion about this single double beat use of the metronome of the pendulum notations in the French literature, it's really interesting for me to see and to have a look also, and I do it regularly, to people who really defend the single beat use, because I'm interested to see how problems are solved. I am not talking about the theories that reject the uh, metronome as, a, as that it was broken, that Beethoven's metronome sound uh, ticked faster upstairs and downstairs, or that, that uh, people didn't know how to use the metronome. I'm not talking about those theories because I don't think they are valid and uh, not even worth our time. But I'm talking to really serious in-depth research from people who take the single bit use approach as a kind of point of departure and see how they come up with certain solutions because problems there are. We have tens of thousands of metronome numbers out of which certainly for the fast movements we can maybe only play 10% at maximum, maximum at the speed that the metronome is indicating if you single bit. So it's really interesting to me to dive into that. I was given uh, by a gentleman named Martin Norton. He was so kind of sending me um, his research uh, through Facebook. Really appreciate that. I'm going to have a look with you at his on his article, Chinese Impossible Metronome Marks, so impossible also quote unquote. So in um, suggesting that there is a solution for that, that there are not impossible, which is really interesting to see. I'm just checking if I'm in focus. Um, and so I dived into that and learned what he had to talk about. Now, let's be honest up front. Mr. Nordhain um, is a really strong believer of the single beat notation. He's really a strong non-believer of the double beat notation. And but So that's, to be honest up front, I'm, I'm going to have an objective approach to this work and you make you take from that whatever you want. This is an article published in 2013 in the Musical Times, so an important magazine. So I made extensive notes for this, in fact, because as I said, it's not to tackle things down, but I think take things seriously. And so typically what I do is go uh, thing by thing, element by element, and just having my own reflections on that see if I can adjust some of my standpoint or not. So um, my notes, I don't know if I will make them available. If I do so, it will be in the coming weeks on the mailing list. So if you're interested in that, I might rework this to an article and then I send it out to the members of my mailing list. There is a link in the description if you want to join us and you get a free ebook and things like that. So there we go. So one big thumbs up for Mr. Norton, and that's that he takes the metronome numbers seriously. Again, theories that don't take the metronome numbers seriously or that say we have to deal with 20-25% slower, that's nonsense. Those metronome numbers were ticking at those speeds, at the pianos, at the desks, wherever of those people who made the metronome numbers. And you know what? Those people were smart enough to understand that if a metronome is ticking in 60, it should match the second. So all those great musicians like Moschelis, Czerny, Beethoven of all people, and you had Hummel, you had Tomacek, you name it, they were capable of seeing and knowing if the metronome was working. So we better take it seriously, and that's what Mr. Norton does. And that alone is refreshing in this study on the metronome. So let's continue on that track. The second big thumbs up for Mr. Norton is that he starts right away in acknowledging the problem. His study uh, topic here, Czerny, he says many of those metronome numbers, if not the vast majority, is simply unplayable from our standpoint. That's really courageous because if you dive into discussion forums on this, you even hear uh, people who are, have a really big name in the field uh, uh, responding at the end just practice a little bit harder or even worse those people in those days might have been just more talented than we are this is something we have to accept well i don't accept the fact that genetically it's even not possible that the early 19th century musician had the um, had a different muscle system or nerve, nerve system that allowed him to play in tempi which were considerably faster than we are able to do ourselves. So Mr. Norton at the beginning of his article is giving the same conclusion. He's even pointing to the metronome numbers that Bach gave, um, the Kleine Preduden, which he says, well, the only one who is really not even, is coming closer but not even reaching that is Glenn Gold. Of all pianists, I admire Glenn Gold, 
he had really fast fingers, so if he is not able to play even this kleine preludium in the tempo that Czerny gives, we have a problem. Yes, we do. Um, I'm going to break this article down in some uh, chapters. I will be jumping now to the conclusion, because that's, of course, what we are waiting for. And with this strong introduction, it interests us how Mr. Nortein formulates his conclusion. So as a conclusion, he actually writes that we will never know if Czerny played his works according to his own tempi. That's not so strong. I'm, I'm sorry to tell, but that's not a strong conclusion. Because we do know that Czerny really uh, wanted you to play his works in his metronome-indicated speeds. It's, only, it's even written in the Piano School, Opus 500, of which we can assume that Mr. Norton has written, has read that. So there you literally found that the metronome indications give you the speed in which your works are to, have to be played on. And certainly also in part three on Beethoven, of course that's not his own works, but there at least you have the metronome indications of Beethoven's works, which Czerny believe that you should follow. So that's not a very strong conclusion of this article, but he then goes further, and that's very strange, that at the beginning of the article he indicates it's, it's the vast majority of the Czerny metronomers seem to be unreachable. Then he points out to one performance of Leslie Howard on YouTube, who plays Opus uh, 299, the 39th attitude of that Opus number, in a tempo that's really close to the, metrical, the, the metronome indication, read literally. I'll give you a small fragment of that. So if you're not familiar with Leslie Howard, is he is a really accomplished pianist. He is one of the few, maybe the only one who recorded all list piano work, so he's not Mr. Nobody. So that leaves me a little bit on my hunger. It's very easy to say Chinese not metronomers are unreachable. We will never know if he played accordingly. So just that one little recording of Leslie Howard, very um, with, with a lot of mistakes, not pointing out to <laughs> His cap capacities as a pianist is a great pianist. So that should prove that Czerny metronome numbers should be read single beat as we do it today. That's very strange. Doesn't convince me. So let's dive into his argumentation. So at the beginning of his article, again, after quote, after stating that vast majority of the Czerny numbers are practically impossible to play, Norton starts to evaluate some alternative theories, uh, alternative compared to the single beat uh, theory, so that every tick is indicating the value of the note that's uh, being projected. So quarter note 60, every tick is a quarter note. That's just basically the single beat theory explained. So he starts by rejecting the broken metronome uh, theory, the misused metronome, and that's a very good thing. So let, let's get rid of those silly theories that people, uh, I cannot understand, even put their time in. Then interesting, he moves on to the variable use of the metronome, so that's, and surprisingly enough, he, he points to Clemens von Gleich. Clemens von Gleich published a lot on the um, metronome research, but the variable use of metronome, the thing that Lothar should have mentioned, of course, the book is uh, Talsma, because that's where also Clemens von Gleich had this inspiration from. So Talsma, 18, 1980, used, write, wrote about the variable use of the metronome, simple and uh, simple words everything below allegretto should be read single beat everything above say, allegretto should be read double beat he rejects that theory and i think that is rightfully so as 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 important this book is there is no proof for that even there is counter proof for that and we're going to make also in the interviews with Lorenz a video about that so rightfully he rejects like that but then he concludes in his article and that's very strange then now we can move on now that we have, it means that I have proven that there is no alternative for the single bit use, we can assume that Chinese metronome numbers are read as we think, as we still read metronome numbers today. That's a very fast move because 2013, already this book was published three years before and this book is Lorenz Guardian book Taktun Pendelschlag. Well, you don't have to agree with that, but Publishing an article about the subject of metronome numbers, not having read this book, 
that was published three years ago, I think it's on an academic level something that you should not expect and you should not actually accept as well as an editorial board maybe even of a magazine, sorry to say that. Certainly if a book like this is published with the famous white green color editing house of Cash Bichler, which is one of the leading musicology editors we have in, on this globe, so you better have read this. It's important, why? Guardian is rejecting all the same theories as he does. So basically, Guardian's conclusion is, I come to the same double beat conclusion. So Mr. Norton skips this research completely for whatever reason, and then continues by concluding, which is also a kind of weak to conclude on based upon your own arguments of rejecting other theories, but anyway, that the single beat use that we have today is also applicable on Czerny. At least mentioning the alternative is in an article something that you should do, not pretend for your writers that it doesn't exist. So the author moves then to a very interesting chapter and that interests me a lot. He's going to give us sources who, uh, and I have to take my notes to really uh, stay on top of that, uh, con contemporary sources that speak on the Czerny etudes as being unrealistically fast. He's going to serve us some of those quotes. And that interests me a lot because I really wonder why he's going to find them. As far as I know, and I've not read everything, he's got none. It's, it's, he will have a difficult time finding quotes who comments on metronome numbers that are unplayable fast. So the first source, which is an anonymous source from the Allgemeine Musicalische Zeitung, um, he speaks about, not about journey, but it's, it, as Nordheim quotes, one rushes through the named operas from the overture on in forced tempos, adagio and andante at a strong gallop as fast as possible and try in this way to avoid every clear understanding of the intention of the composer, his particular understanding of the text, his voice leading and his instrumentation. Interesting quote though, but I don't hear the author speak about too fast metronome numbers. What he does reflect upon is the same as I've been covering quite a lot now, also in the Tomaszek Fink videos, I will link them here, we'll talk about that later, that he is rejecting the too fast performances of Adagios and Andantes. So what does that prove on the Czerny metronome numbers? But strangely enough, the author makes a three-step argumentation based on this, uh, on this quote. He says, quotes like this prove that people were not accepting too fast performances, which is true. Second point is, we have seen that the metronome numbers of Czerny should be read single beat, and if played single beat, they are very fast. So conclusion, even though that this author is not speaking about the metronome number of Czerny, we can assume that if he would comment on Czerny's works, he would have condemned the speed as well. You might not believe me, but I tried to have a link to Mr. Notine's article. It's literally there. I mean, that's, that's no argument. I mean, first, the author doesn't speak about metronome numbers. He speaks about the performance of a particular opera of Adagios and Dante's, which really fits into what I'm saying all the time, that around 1840, people are going to play faster and faster and faster. It are the same people who gave us the really fast metronome numbers who started in 1840 to complain of those fast performances. So they are not going to complain about their own metronome numbers, they're complaining on the new generation performance practices. That's a complete misunderstanding of the context, in my opinion. Anyway, whatever you take from that, you cannot assume that if an author speaks about Adagios and Andantes who was played too fast, that you jump incorporating your own understanding of the single beat use of the metronome numbers that if that author would ever have heard Czerny or would have commented on Czerny's work, he certainly would have condemned those works by the speed of them. Because we don't know how Czerny played those works. That's the matter of the, of the research. So incorporating the conclusion of your research in your arguments, well, that's saying nothing. It's misquoting, it's not misquoting, but it's mis... mis explaining the quote in the context and certainly misusing that. So let's move on to the second quote. The second quote is again Allgemeine Musikale Zeitung. The whole article is, is uh, uh, the context of the article is Musikale, Allgemeine Musikale Zeitung, very valuable source, but I wonder why not going to Vienna and see some uh, really 
close to Chinese sources. But anyway, he moves to just Northern moves to another source of that, which he doesn't doesn't name doesn't name by name in the text, which is surprisingly in the footprint we learn that it is Fink, and he might have just used the name Fink because that was an important critic in the day. Remember, I've made a video on Tomacek Fink where where Fink asks Tomacek to give the metronome numbers of metronomized uh, Mozart's Don Giovanni as uh, Tomacek heard the Prague Orchestra, so basically the same orchestra as Mozart played with the 7087 premiere in Prague. So Tomacek heard the performance and from memory he gave the metronome numbers, by which Frink, by publishing them, wanted to prove that the current generations, again, it's not, ref it's not commenting on the metronome numbers that are too fast, that proves it because he publishes those Tomacek numbers to prove that the current generation is playing the, Mozart of, the music of Mozart way too fast. If Fink comments on Czerny too fast metronome numbers, that would be extremely important. So the quote of that Mr. Nordon then gives us here in his article um, is Fink writing about the daily exercises Opus 30, 337. So quote, was Czerny not laughing, we are reading Fink now, was Czerny not laughing when he wrote this preface? Then he leaves out something with three dots. Everyone who is able to do this day after day, we promise him his head will become like a lantern. That's true. So what's the conclusion based on this quote that Mr. Notan draws? Is, uh, he says, the reviewer's attitude to the technical demands made by the composer indicates that they were not met by many pianists. Though, so that's the conclusion of this source, and I don't know with you, but I have a kind of unsatisfied feeling. Um, it's kind of building up of evidence that would lead to a kind of feeling, well, yeah, you're right, in those days people were really commenting on Czerny and fast tempo, so you're right, move on, what's the thing? It's obvious, in that time even, people considered China to be too fast, so we are, why wouldn't we? try to play in those tempi if people in 1840 were really complaining about that. But is, if that, is that really what Fink is saying? So luckily today we have Mr. Google and we're not depending on the, uh, on, on, on the strength of the, of the researchers or the musicologists to give us only what they want. So I dived into Google and looked what the source really said. To start with, Fink is not talking about speeds. Again, as in the previous quote, there's no mentioning of speed in Czerny work, which is really here more important than in the previous quote. The previous quote was not even talking about Czerny at all. Here we have a direct review of Czerny etudes given by a really leading uh, uh, music critic, which Fink was. He was not Mr. Nobody, he was Mr. Somebody. So let's take that seriously. But Fink is not writing about speed. What is he writing about? So, interesting enough, if we go and see what Norton chooses to leave out of this quote between the brackets, we see here Fink writing actually what he means. Many of those passages must be played 20 or 30 times, as Fink writes, other 6, 8, 12, 15 and 16 times after each repetition sign. Only after every coda there is a bit of time to relieve, to then again start with another etude until all 40 studies are played. And then he continues, if you do that every day your head will explode. So that gives totally different light on the same quote. This is not a a quote that you should want to use to prove that Chinese tempi are impossible, even on the contrary. Fink explicitly said that if you play, play those works of Czerny that many times with that many repetitions, then your head will explode. I can, I can confirm that. If you do that, your head will explode. But Fink says, if you play that a few days, playing, not commenting on the un unplayable fact of those works. The contrary, playing, this again. He assumes that you can play it. So, but it gets worse, I've saved the worst part to the last. If you write an article as a researcher on metronome numbers and journey, and you would find a quote 
by a Mr. Fink, so Mr. Somebody, who explicitly talks about the metronome numbers given by Czerny. Would you leave that out in the quote? Would you not serve that to your readers? So I will read what is just before where Nortein starts to quote Fink. So just before Nortein decides that his readers should not have the whole quote, Fink actually adds something in advance to what he will be saying to the repeats 30, 40 times. He says, if you would play the etudes according to the met metronome indications given by Czerny and then do it 30 times and then do it several days, then your head will implode or explode, whatever is in there. So this is totally the contrary of what Mr. Notine wants us to believe. If you only had his first two sentences, yeah, you could say, that Mr. Fink is commenting on the speed because that's the thing that we think today. Czerny is very fast. So we just give some sentences that feed that idea that we already have. And then you build up this consciousness of, yeah, in those days people were playing, well, con condemning also the fast performances and the metronome of Czerny. But that's not what Fink writes. Fink writes if you play, again, play in capitals, according to the metrical numbers, given by Czerny, 30 times a day is daily exercise, your head will explode. He explicitly underlines the fact that people were supposed to be able to play those daily exercises in the metronome numbers of Czerny. So why using that source, that quote, that explicitly acknowledge the, the perfect usability of those metronome numbers as a source to prove the opposite? That's strange for me. I have no explanation for that. So let's move on to the third quote, again from the Allgemeine Musicale Society. There's a Mr. Anonymous. Many of those uh, reviews are written by people that are difficult to track, so that's no problem. Um, so Nortein quotes freely, and that's also no problem. In other reviews too, we can see that China technical demands must have been problematic. This sentence is, however, problematic because the other, the other uh, uh, reviews to, the, the word to implies that the previous quotes we just been re, have been rejected to be of any use of metronome numbers of, of Czerny. And in fact, the second one by Fink is explicitly uh, making those metronome numbers eligible for us normal pianists of today. So that's a problematic uh, sentence. But then he continues. Uh, we can see in the review of the School of Virtuoso, Opus 365, the reviewer considers the work most suitable for those who still have to work on their technical skills. And he refers to example one, where he gives a, uh, uh, an example of that uh, etude bundle. So he says, it's not surprising that the reviewer warned pianist against trying to play the etudes too fast, especially if their technique was still developing. Okay, again, let's do some background tracking and see what the quote really says. Firstly, in the way uh, Mr. Norton quotes uh, this Mr. Anonymous, there is a warning for not fully developed techniques, so to play the etudes in the indicated tempi. There is not a single word to be read in that quote that the metronome numbers by Czerny are too fast. As again Mr. Norton wants us to believe, there is no such thing in that quote, again, to reject the metronome numbers that they are too fast. The author just wants to warn you that you not just won't have to try from the beginning to play those pieces too fast. It's not even mentioning the metronome numbers. So that's a logical thing. If you are a piano teacher today and you have a student and he's going to study an etude, are you going to say just play it from the first day as fast as you can if the technique of your student is not developed enough, now you're going to build up that technique by playing slow first and then increase the tempo. So why, again, must this quote serve the idea, the general idea that people were rejected Chinese tempo? I'd said in the beginning, this very long review, there's no such thing as rejecting those metronome numbers. It doesn't exist. You can find reactions of people who say, I would play it slower. But never, never, ever, ever you're going to find 
a quote, a source that those early 19th century metronome numbers are unplayable. Never. So don't say that the double beat theory should show with some evidence when you're using quotes out of the context, serving your audience, your readers, with just very incomplete sources that you even are guiding them in the wrong direction, as we, I think, clearly sh have seen. But anyway. So I think we can just skip this part of contemporary sources, which is really essential in the building up of the arguments in Mr. Notine's article, because he really wants you to believe that people in those days rejected Chinese fast metronome numbers. It's part of his explanation, it's part of his solution. That's what I said at the beginning. If you assume that the single beat notation is the right way to go, you will have a problem because those tempi are un unplayable. So thumbs up for him of stating that. But why trying to find sources that already in the 19th century would have stated that? Because there are no such thing as sources. So why are you trying? That's the only, that's the only argument that single beat use of metronome articles and research have to prove that they were unplay unplayable, but because they are. So anyway, we continue. It's a very long episode, but I hope you don't mind. Then he, no turn is continuing in a new set of evidence. So if the sources were not enough, and it is interesting to compare journey with contemporaries. That's a research I really encourage to do because that's opening a context. He is, in fact, most prominently going to compare journey with, with Chopin, which is a very good thing to do. Remember, Chopin was in Vienna for some time. He knew journey. He commented on journey, but he was a young guy who wanted to make his own way, move to Paris, of course. And then he had, of course, his own set of etudes. He also incorporates very interesting grammar modulus and uh, in, the, in the comparison. And what he wants to do with that is as interesting as his point of departure is, is really strange. What he basically is doing is counting the notes per second based on the metronome indications. And he comes to the conclusion that Czerny has the most notes per second. So by definition, Czerny is the most difficult composer. Although Nordheim gives in his own article contemporary sources who said the opposite, that Chopin was the more, more difficult uh, composer, most difficult in issues to play. And that's strange that you want to prove the difficulty of a piece by just the number of notes. Yes, if you have the single beat application for the metronome numbers of Czerny, you will end up with having way, 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 way more notes, very many notes per second. But that's another chapter. He could easily have mentioned the other solution, this double beat, because this gives a very clear solution to that. But anyway, we have contemporary sources that reject that fact that Czerny was more difficult than Chopin. But again, Nordheim needs that to come to his conclusion. Remember, we will never know, quote, if Czerny really was able to play his own metronome numbers. He might have been an exceptional pianist that just could do it, like Mr. Leslie Howard could play that one particular sonata with 40% wrong notes. But that's very weak as a conclusion, but he has to do something, right? But why not go to Marshallis? I'm quoting Marshallis a lot, but he is interesting. He lived in the time and he commented a lot of that. He was an accomplished pianist. He met Chopin. They played concerts even for the Royal Court in France. They collaborated in the, in the etude part of the Fetis Method and Method, so they knew each other. The daughter of Marshallis went to Paris to study sing, singing with Pauline Viardon, a Chopin student, and she had lessons with Chopin as well. So Marshallis is commenting on Chopin's work, which he finds difficult to play. Why? Not because it's so many notes, because of the harmonies because of the new grips on the piano. It literally says, Marshallis, I can, my hands refuse to grip the modulations. That's the new thing of Chopin. So yes, Chopin was more difficult in that time than, um, than Czerny. So just by counting the notes per second, coming to that conclusion yourself, Rejecting all the evidence there is that Czerny was not considered to be the most difficult one. You can read over and over there in the 19th century. Even go to Riemann, end of the 19th century, he will give you the reasons why Czerny is difficult. It's not one word with speed. 
So um, that's a weak argument, I'm sorry to say. If then you hear people like Mr. Norton comment on the double beat uh, research, which he apparently didn't read, that it has no evidence, well, that's surprisingly because this is no evidence at all. But anyway, it's a kind of uh, her hinein interpretation. I cannot say it in other words. Anyway, he needs that conclusion to build up his argument again that Czerny was even in those days considered to be so exceptionally difficult that nobody would even try to play. So there is no such source, there's no such underlying. And I hope in this extensive episode I have been, I've been going through this very detail just to prove that I take this seriously. Not to break it down, but if it's not correct in my opinion, I just say it like that. So to wrap this up, there is no such thing as a quote that you will find that will prove you that the journey metronome numbers of any other metronome numbers, we should not take it separately because all the other metronome numbers by Moses and all those people are the same, even going back to the France 18th century and 17th century. There's not so much difference between them. They're all the same. It's a problem. All of the metronome numbers are a problem. So you'll not find people rejecting those metronome numbers around 1830, 1840, and 50, not by contemporaries, never. Secondly, the fact that Chinese etudes were considered to be unplayable fast, we have seen that's not the case. The authors, even that Norton serves, if you read the complete sources, the complete quotes they give, on the contrary, just the reflection that it might be sometimes exaggerated to repeat all those exercises 30 times a day, but they're not unplayable fast. So that's done, I think. So it leaves us with one question that is really so surprising for me. Why not just doing the same exercise with the double beat theory in mind? There are, as we speak, over a 20, 20 authors who gives the metrical understanding as Merzen, and the list goes longer. You can stay at the sidelines, I keep on refusing that, I keep on refusing that, that's your good right. But just turning the perspective, it all falls in place suddenly. I've given, as an advice, just play Opus 299 of Czerny in the double beat structure and your life will change. The weakest part of the article is why not opening the research and instead of looking only at one solution, trying to find quotes that prove things that you want to prove, Putting them out of the context, why not just giving your readers, the musicians you're really serving evidence to a broader context? Why is that? Answer of those people like Mr. Notan will be there is no such evidence. Yeah, okay, then it's the end of story. But I hope if you have stayed with me so long in this very in one of the longest episodes I've ever made, that I sufficiently proved that the arguments given in this article are no arguments at all. So, we stay then with the same problems and we should uh, remove the quote marks uh, around impossible because then these Chinese metronome numbers are impossible. And they will pay, stay impossible for the rest of our lives until some generic, some genetic change will happen to our body system that will make us possible to play that. The music will go along with that, but anyway, so that's just an open question that I have for all those people, why not opening that and take it seriously. Anyway, thank you for staying with me so long. I doubt if any of you are still here, but if you are, I thank you for watching. Go ahead and do your research on your own. Uh, contact me, follow along this journey, it's really fascinating. But read everything with an open mind and put things that people serve you as contextual evidence in the context. Go read the original quotes uh, and see if the proof still holds. That was it for today. Hope you liked it. Maybe share this video. Maybe, maybe not. You will uh, take a lot of time with your friends if you do, but I will be glad to you if you did. And we see each other very soon again. Bye.